We'd like to welcome Commissioner Britling here from um, Cass County Commission um, running on a pose. So that's that's nice. <laughs> that's very comfortable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, we I wanted to let you know we had sent out questionnaires, but Commissioner was having an issue with email. So he's going to address some of the questions from the questionnaire. Um, but what I would like to do, because we have about 20 minutes, 25 minutes to have a conversation. Um, could I just quickly have everybody, um, you've met Elizabeth already, yes, right? right? Okay, so we'll start this way around the room. And by that time, I bet Trenton and Sam might be in time. You're a okay. There's more people coming late. What time did the start for us? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> This is like the third of this morning. Yeah, they were here until it was 30 this morning, too. So, David, would you like to start with Jennifer? And, and also, note company name and how you're involved with the HBA sure. for the foundation. Yeah, my name is David Reed. I'm with Radiant Homes. I'm a home builder uh, based in Florio and also the president of the HBA. Nancy Fry of Labor Masters and the current vice president of the Home Builders Care Foundation. So, I'm David with Africa's Homes and the current chair of the publication. Good morning, Don Everett, Senator Everett Custom Homes, still with developers, state rep, and a past president of the state. Commissioner Rock Schneider with PHS. I think we've been. I think we've been. I'm Joyce Walsh, I'm just a direction, and I'm on the board of directors. Also, Krista. I'm Krista with the HBA. I think. Trent here to the Cass Clay Community Land Trust on public issues. Sam McDonald with Cass Clay Community Land Trust. Awesome. Thanks everybody for coming too. Uh, and we will have some more stragglers coming in, so that's not a problem. Everybody, we appreciate everybody taking time to come and be with us this morning. And thank you, you Commissioner, for being here as well. We greatly appreciate it. So um, this is a little different. We're not having an actual forum since. Commissioner Brightly is running on a pose. We're just going to have a conversation. So, would you like to go ahead and? I, I would. It? Okay. I was unable to respond to your question here because I didn't. My computer was out black until late yesterday. So, so I, I would like to give you a little bit about my background. Uh, I'm married. Uh, I met my wife. Well, we were both undergraduate students at the University of North Dakota back in the early '60s. Uh, when I finished undergraduate school, we married, and I then attended law school. In uh, 65, I went to work for the Legislative Council in Bismarck during a session, uh, only one session, because during that time period, I was hired by the firm of Armstead Twitchell and Wes Fargo to practice law with them for some time to come. We moved here in early 67. Um, We've lived in West Fargo the entire time. We're in our second home only in that time period. We have four adult children. Two of them live in West Fargo, a son and a daughter. And two of them live in California, in the South Bay area, not far from San Jose. One in a New Gothenburg, one in Fremont, and the other in a little town that is next, almost next to San Jose. Good, Mas uh, They both are, well, one works in, in the computer industry because he works for a company called LAM Research. They're a NASDAQ company, and they don't make computer chips, but they make and sell the equipment used to make computer chips. And the other one works as a master's degree in film and video, and he runs a production studio for Salesforce in downtown San Francisco. Obviously, he rides the park there now. Uh, I practiced with the firm of Onset Twitchell from 67 until 2010, 40 some years. Um, I've been retired for 12 years now. We continue to live in West Fargo. My wife is. Um, an addict as far as flowers are concerned. She belongs to that two or three flower groups, the Cheyenne, the Fargo, uh, attends all kinds of seminars. And if she's not working in her flowers, she was uh, playing bridge. In fact, she now has one, one day a week where they play by computer. 
<laughs> in any event, um, I was elected almost four years ago to the county commission, but I'd like to visit with you a little bit about the districts. There are five districts in Cass County. We're required on a 10 year cycle to reapportion them if that's necessary. <clears throat> in 2020, we did have to redraw the lines of those five districts. However, in doing so, we did not uh, get rid of any, we did not double up two commissioners into one district. They, they were all still in their own, one of the five districts. Two and four are up for reelection at this time. Two years from now, one, three, and five will be up. The reason I, I want to talk about that is that at the primary election, there were over 5,000 ballots that were out that didn't bother to vote for District 4. Over 5,000 of them didn't. Now, I've talked with some people about what why that happened. Uh, one of the things is that we were the last two items on the long ballot with all of the water, with the, with the park districts and the schools. Uh, so maybe voter fatigue had something to do with it, but I'm inclined to believe that people don't understand. Although I have to live in District 4 to serve that district, everybody in the county gets to vote uh, on that. And I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that there are a lot of voters out there that don't understand that. And, and if nothing else, I want to get that word out. Uh, give you a little quick about my interests at, at, at the county level. Uh, they can be labeled into three categories. The first would be public safety. The second would be education. And the third would be a concern about the managing of the assets of the county so as to minimize the need for increased taxes. The the public safety factor can, be, can best be explained by saying that during this, let me back up. We approved budgets, and we've just, we're, we have our final hearing on the 19th for 2023. The 2022 budget did not include any funds for increasing the entry level compensation for people in the sheriff's department. We were having difficulty in recruiting them. So notwithstanding the fact that that was, wasn't included in their budget, we found ways to do so without increasing any tax burden to the residents of this county. What we did was increase the entry level compensation for people in the sheriff's department so as to be even more competitive than others so that we could fully staff that department. In addition, we've authorized the sheriff's department to provide on a contract basis, law enforcement services for both the cities of Castleton and Kindred. We are also in negotiations with the city of Horace to provide that type of service for 2023 for that city as well. What we've done in that budget is we've increased the number of staff members in the sheriff's department so that we could actually provide at least two staff members regularly in the city of Morris. Uh, those are some of the things that we've done to try to provide that type of activity throughout the county. More importantly, uh, uh, the sheriff's department has conducted this summer active student response training in four school districts, Kindred, Castleton, North, and the, the school district that's serviced by the, uh, in the area of Tower City, that, that is in more than one county, that school district is focusing. But in any event, for example, the one at Kindred, there were over a hundred attendees at that, that session. What it involved, was first of all a, a, a presentation by video of how you would go about addressing that problem if should if it should occur in a school district here. Uh, 
in addition to the sheriff's department in, in providing additional information, representatives were from both Stanford and Ascension providing uh, first aid safety recommendations for those that would be involved from the fire part departments, from the uh, EMT staff, uh, those types of people, uh, to know exactly how they would be protected by the sheriff's staff and how they would enter the building and how they would respond to people that were injured or were injured in, in that type of a, of a situation. One of the interesting things is that at, at most of the time they used uh, mannequins for the injured people that it would have to be transported out. Uh, at Castleton, uh, their superintendent authorized their drama department to volunteer students. So at that field, we had extra bodies involved. I, I found that to be very educational, both for the adults and for the students as well. As far as the uh, education is concerned, Cass County, along with with the private sector, many of many of the businesses throughout the Park Moore area have contributed, along with the state, funds to support the construction of the Workforce Academy. We we will we have a continuing obligation in that faction as well, and we have authorized the budgeting of that money for another four years. The that activity is is also in combination with the school districts who who have stepped forward and are will be funding the operation and maintenance of that facility so as to facilitate their students collectively going to that facility to be trained in areas that we need qualified workers in in, in various ways one of the top ones is is cyber security and IT, IT work? Well, I, I'm going to jump in for a minute. We we uh, raised a, probably a million um, from the association and foundation members, and and um, one of our members, don't Don, donated land to the center. We're very well versed in the academy, yeah. it, the Center for Career Innovation Center, um, but obviously skilled workforce for us is a pretty critical need. And has been for a while. So, can I ask a couple? Because I think there's a couple sure. questions that might be um, going back to the safety, public safety side, um, and Boris, and how that's working out with the county. Um, any changes on the horizon for increase? You were talking about that it's been a challenge to hire and that sort of thing. And then fire safety for the community, how does that work? Um, with the fire departments and such. Well, the chorus is different. It does not have a city fire department. Yeah. They years ago uh, established under the North Coast statutory law a fire district that includes more than sit than the old city of Horace. Right. But much more than than what where the city of Horace is going to grow to as well. So that's a little bit different. And so the city does not control that department. That's what I was saying. Is it a county thing then, or how does no? That, that it's it's a private entity that is organized under the North Dakota Century Code. It's a fire district. Okay. And it's managed in that in, by the statutes that control fire districts that are established in North Dakota. Okay. The the reason that we have contracted with Castleton and Kindred, and we plan to do so with of course, it's, it's very difficult on a cost basis for the smaller communities to warrant full-time staffing, equipment, and, and benefits for, for those people. And on a contract basis, we can provide at least two for each of those three cities, each two officers, to provide that type of almost instant service where it would not be available otherwise. Uh, if any anybody have any questions, just raise your hand and I'll stop talking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the one of the more important things is 
Congress has on two occasions passed legislation that directly funds to counties and cities care and ARPA funds. Your county commission has earmarked all of those care and ARPA funds for projects that would otherwise result in an additional tax burden for the constituents of Cass County. Give you an example. We have a uh, joint powers agreement with Cass and Clay counties and the cities of Morehead, Barbo, and West Barbo to provide 911 services. The facility has, has been out as we've outgrown that facility that presently exists. And annually, the, the equipment upgrades are unbelievable because we need to be able to respond for 911 calls to, to various entities, uh, hospitals, ambulance service, fire departments, police departments. Uh, that's an expensive situation. We are, we are in the process of developing a plan for a new facility and, and will that will be funded with ARPA and CARE funds. Additionally, our jail facility has outgrown itself dramatically. Even though it's not that old, the county has grown so dramatically. <clears throat> the as of the first of the month, we were over capacity. We had overflow so that we contract with seven other counties to take our prisoners. We also uh, have had to notify Fargo and West Fargo that we'll only accept a felony or Felony type people, those that are a problem to the safety of the community. And misdemeanor people will have to be out on bail because we don't have any room for them. Now, the jail expense is an expensive construction process, as you folks know. We are all we are already have completed our studies for the growth of the county and what growth that would require of our our jail capacities and we are hopefully in the process so that early spring we will be advertising for bids for an addition to that facility so that we can eliminate our problem with overcrowding <clears throat> it's complicated in additional ways for example you cannot have male and female prisoners in the same pot so this two months ago, we had like 60 some female prisoners at, at Cass County Jail. That doesn't complete, completely use that pod, but it, what it does, it eliminates those beds from the male population. That too is a problem for us. So, and we have to address that as well. That's gonna be an expensive proposition, but it is an absolute necessity. And we already have the land. Apparently, the county commissioners who, who saw it through the original construction were smart enough to buy another 200 foot piece of property for the full east and west length along the jail on the south side so that there is there is no problem with real with real property costs. The uh, can I ask a question? Sure, actually, step in anytime. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. That's all really because we don't we don't agree about that. Cass County doesn't always make news, but maybe one of the things that does end up in the news is the new rules that tax incentives go through both the city, the county, and the school district. And I think there's good oversight with that, but it also creates three opportunities for um, maybe more negative or naysayers or, or press to take hold on some of those issues. I was just curious your perspective on that. If there's a way to streamline that process at all, well, because sometimes you'll have a, we'll just, say a developer or whoever's going for the incentive to go through one process tries to please, please one entity and then that displeases another entity and it's it's a tough in all candor i don't think that uh, the levels have, have the three there are three levels city county and, and school district all have a, a, a role and play in in those uh, allocations of, of reduction in cost to the developer. The county has looked at those very carefully. 
And for the last three, we have told them we will not approve a 10, we will a 10 year period. We will, however, negotiate with the city uh, as to what would be a proper based on what this need is for that development. Uh, we may be more cautious than the city of Fargo is, but I can tell you this, that in the last uh, almost four years now, we've we've gone backwards on our mill levy, the county level, and that's not solved for other governmental entities. Are we conservative as far as expenditure of funds by the constituents of the of the county? Yes, we are, and I, I there's no way we can deny that. Uh, we are. We have three of those that are presently. We've told them we would negotiate with them as to the terms, uh, but we were not. We would not accept the tenure to the time period. Yeah, and I guess you know the one of the feedback I've heard is that it seems like the applicant gets kind of hit between the city and the county instead of you know being able to work it out before the hearings between the city and the county on what would be the joint agreement. I I don't see it as as that way because even though. We have on at the county basis have not approved those. The city has, and they're they're all moving forward, all three of those projects. The developer feels apparently comfortable with what the city has provided him and is not concerned that the county <clears throat> is not going to jump in and go along as as completely as the city has. They're all under construction. So apparently the developer has has made a decision that it's even without the county's blessing, uh, this is a project that we can afford to build. Yeah, yeah mine wasn't specific to any yeah. applicant in particular. It's a good question. I love questions. <laughs> um, is there maybe to to wrap up? Is there anything else that you would like to cover on what? Um, being unopposed for the, the seat, um, are there any other things that you want to address, see the commission address going forward? Because you mentioned the public safety, public well, education, and then the, the fiscal up. responsibility. Yeah. The, the only other thing that I would uh, add is that earlier on, the uh, FM Realtor Association did endorse my candidacy, even when there was some opposition. And they have a PAC and they contributed to uh, my effort at the primary election. I, I, that's public information and you should be mindful of that. Okay, definitely. I appreciate that. Um, we've, the HBA has been a little short on staff over the last year. So <laughs> there, some of our election activities were pretty challenging and in, in, in focus. So, Appreciate hearing that. Um, and the Realtors Association, big collaborators with them. So that's wonderful. So they I, actually have a, a, a formed PAC where they fund and contribute to candidates. Yes. So so does the in the association, it's at the state level for us. Um, not local, but state. So very good to know. Um, is there anything else before we wrap up? All right. Well, it was sure a pleasure to just get to meet you and get you in the building. It, it's um, we probably should do coffee or something. So uh, the, the only thing I would mention that at one time there were only three attorneys in the Amstead Twitchell, Amstead Twitchell Brightway. That firm has now have 20 plus attorneys with offices not only in West Fargo, but in Castleton and Hill Pro as well, staffed with attorneys and other staff members. Wow. Um, all right. Well, thank you very, thank very you. much. I'm Bryce Jensen. I'm the CEO for the HBA. Um, I know you both of you very well. So um, we, uh, we'd we like to thank you for coming today and giving us your time. Um, we have members of the HBA and the foundation here and public issues committee. Everybody's going to introduce themselves in a second. But so this is a little different format than what we were previously doing. Um, 
in this case, and I think both of you are pretty familiar with it anyway, but um, each of you will have two minutes to share your platform, to do an introduction and share your platform. Elizabeth has the, um, the yellow card is the caution card, and that's going to remind you at the 30 second mark to, to keep that in check. Um, and the red card, obviously, is just to finish out your sentence and complete if you're glad there. Um, the, and then once we're completed, we're going to do a, a Q&A session and open it up um, to questions for that. Um, we'll do closing remarks then and give you another two minutes to do those closing remarks with that 30 second mark being the yellow card. Um, and then we'll let you get back to your work days. So you guys can campaign or whatever it is you're going to be doing. So um, with that, I'd like to start off by having everybody do introductions and please again, company name and how you're involved with the HBA. In, you guys know that, right? Yeah. Okay, so we'll start with David then. Yeah, hi, I'm David Reed with Brady Helms, uh, home builder of the case and part of here, and also president of the HBA. Yes, Kelly with Labor Masters, uh, vice president for the Home Builders Foundation. Uh, Andy, also with Labor Masters, and I'm an associate vice president of the HBA. Sam K. with Dabber Crescent Homes, and the current chair of the competition. I never have a custom home, builder developer, uh, current uh, North Coast State Rep to NHB, and past state and local president. Rocky Schneider with AHS, I'm on the public digital student. I'm Joyce Felsen with Design Direction, and I serve on the board of directors. I'm Jennifer Christopher Trump here with Gas Lake Community Land Trust, public digital student as well. I'm Krista Mind with the HBA. Sam Kim with the Community land trust. All right, thank you. Um, so now um, we will start with um, we'll start with Ben. We'll just go back and forth here. If you would do kind of an introduction platform and help with what you hope to achieve at Michigan. Sounds great. Um, thank you all for having both of us, and uh, thanks for being involved with HGA. I got to have some time on the public issues committee where I feel like I probably learned as probably as much as I was able to contribute. It was a uh, real education and what local business owners were dealing with at the municipal, county, and state level as far as regulatory environments go with their businesses. And uh, I got to see uh, what the needs and uh, wants in the market work. So my name is Ben Hansen. Uh, I am running for the Cass County Commission. I mean, uh, running along with Tony in District 2. Uh, we are the only two candidates in that district and I'm sure it's probably been wrong before, but uh, just in case you have to be from the district in order to run, but the whole county votes for that position. So it's a very interesting, very unique office to run for. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm born and raised here in Fargo. Uh, in my exciting 35 years here, I've made it all the way from North Fargo down to South Fargo as far as my residence goes. <laughs> Uh, if you wanted to, you could probably walk to my house from here. I live, uh, I tell everybody, I live just a block away from the Dairy Queen, which is especially dangerous in summer. And I, <laughs> uh, I have, I spent about 10 years in commercial real estate at a couple of firms that uh, held away with Archer, which you might have been familiar with. I've also had some time in software sales and project management at Microsoft and through a contract through Jones Lang LaSalle through PNSF working on rail projects. But I currently work for a nonprofit here in town, United Way of Gas Clay, so we have the community impact team, and we have the um, group that oversees uh, grant dollars and make sure that they are uh, buying biometrics for success and using those dollars well to serve the vulnerable populations that many more nonprofit members serve. In addition to those things, I've had some time in the North Coast State Legislature, where I was a member of the State House representing Fargo and West Fargo. Uh, from 2012 to 2016, and I think that experience, along with some of my private sector experience, made me a good candidate to understand budgets and going to the county commission. That's my time. Oh, that's <laughs> that's very nice. Thank you, Tony. Oh, good afternoon, Tony Grimberg. Um, much similar to Ben, I didn't migrate from North Fargo to South Fargo. I migrated from Mapleton, North Dakota to Fargo. Um, Redwood High School in West Fargo. Um, I know many of you. Uh, been involved in largely economic development in my career in Fargo. Um, served um, 22 years in the state senate, of which 14 was um, vice chair of appropriations at the table of the only one of the strategic director of the state, um, balance of budgets. Um, 
and then served four years um, on the city commission from 2016 to 2020. Goal goal of, of trying to solve problems um, for growth. I know there's many engagements we had HVA during my tenure um, on the city commission as well. As I mentioned, um, I worked for the you know earlier the economic development. I've um, spent about 11 years at the economic development corporation, um, and then about 11 years leading the development of the NDSC Research Technology Park, which was a economic development enterprise. And um, so some of the background and interest I had in the legislature and just bringing business experience um, to a the economic development role, as well as the city government trying to um, more a business approach to how city um, government um, transpired over the four years I was there. Um, I first got the call to run for county commission from Commissioner Steen, and I said, not interested. And I said, you really should think about it. And um, you know, I thought about it a little bit, he called back, and I said, not interested. And um, didn't know if it was the right time for me to jump back into public life. Um, but after encouragement from Rick and Chad Peterson in particular, um, Chad um, said that the value you could bring was 20 years of experience in the county level with the state legislature, as well as the city of Fargo, um, would be a benefit for when Mary Sherling and her turned out two years. Uh, so you look at the tenure of Chad and Mary and then Rick being gone, Dwayne, um, someone who went into the commission in second term, um, your your experience would be invaluable. So I, I decided to run um, to bring my experience as well as well in economic development, work for development as a lead pillar for um, my role in the life of the county commission. Wonderful. Thank you. So um, the members that are here uh, receive the questionnaires. Um, and got the chance to review those. Um, before I go on, does anybody have any questions that they want to pose? All right. Um, I have a question. I um, well, first, I've been in the trenches with both of you, and so I, I admire both of you as candidates. And um, then there were like three votes that voted against Health and trying to kill the diversion, and then to be safe it on the Senate side. So with, without the two of you, we you know, wouldn't have a diversion either. And so I appreciate that. But one of the questions I have is given that you're both good candidates in our previous forum, we had one candidate and both both forums started out with talking about how confusing the kind of district versus elections are. And part of what we do on all these committees is hoping we have good people run for office. Um, what can the county commission do once you're elected to help foster an environment that gets more people interested in, in, the, in the office? Because Tony, like you said, you have the arm twisted into it a little bit or convinced of it. Um, I know Ben, you, you went back and forth on it as well. And we just, there's been a number of elections in the county that have gone uncontested, and that's probably not healthy. So, is there anything that commission can do themselves to help get business minded folks to run for office? And I should throw out uh, 60 seconds for the answer. So the question will come in 30 seconds. Again. Well, what can we do to help with that, too? I guess maybe. So we'll start with Tony if you want to go first and we'll take turns. Great on that. question. You know, it's interesting. We, um, I think we'd all agree we live in interesting times. Um, when you look at the number of legislative seats of this um, session, how many vacancies there are, people not contested. And so I think it's more of a, is it just the county or certainly not with the city? Because there's a number of candidates that want to run for city commission. I thought in West Fargo or it's spent the same in the rural. Well, but I, and what can the county do? I think being more collaborative with maybe the city governments and looking at ways to have you new know, norms to, you know, what does it mean to be a county commissioner or city commissioner? Um, my sense is a lot of people don't know what the role and responsibility is. And we were talking, Ben and I were talking earlier about a candidate that, um, you know, didn't understand really play up. I mean, announced he was going to run, understand the magnitude of the budgeting and the number process. So you really got to somehow understand that. I think it's an excellent question. That's a little bit broad, but I would like to start by saying I think it's the candidate and their, if you get elected, the elected officials' responsibility to communicate always and every medium possible to your constituents. I remember when I was in the legislature, in addition to responding to basic constituent email and sometimes email letters as well. You know, we had candidate forms, but truly, you know, everyone here is involved because they care. You didn't show up here um, for fun, right? I mean, not that it's not, you know, I mean, but you showed up because you cared. 
but how do you communicate that to people who aren't at the meetings or are frankly too busy and they're just trying to make ends meet, try and get two or three kids to soccer practice and pay a mortgage? And it's by being ever present, it's by going to events that aren't necessarily politically oriented or policy oriented. It's about writing a cost to hire the editor, keeping your social media updated. And just being very responsive. And I do think I have to have in my mind. I have an office and in my time business, I've been a very responsive person. In fact, I'm responsive for five of my time. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, Jeff, I'm I, my question relates to um, because you both have served in, in different roles with um, in political office, um, legislature or um, city commission, and so on. Um, can you give us an example, and in, in not as a county commissioner, but can you give us an example of what you are most proud of while you were serving in that previous role? Then we'll start with you. Well, I think I'm the most, well, I have two things I'm the most proud of. I'll have to one, as the most business oriented one, which is when I was in my second session, I was on the Industry, Business, and Labor Committee and on the Transportation Committee, and I introduced a bill to allow for testing of autonomous vehicles in the state of North Dakota. At the time we were in the fifth state, that allowed testing. The rest of the states were southern, uh, south of the Mason Dixon Line state. So, what I mean by that is, uh, we've been in a good spot for the testing, which we usually lose out on for like military, but then testing to Alaska because I have a, a variety of terrain, which makes sense as toll lines. We, I was able to get uh, that bill passed when it wasn't viewed as being something that was pertinent or pressing. It sounded like the Jetson, you know, self driving vehicles. But now, autonomous technology is something that we're seeing everywhere. And I think by being a good student of what's going on, being comparative at the county level, you can do that comparing yourself to other counties, to other like population counties in other states. I think as a good student of that, and someone who frankly is kind of a nerd that, you know, really enjoys looking at those kinds of things, I think I can bring that value to the table of uh, kind of the county commission. And that's a I built a good way of the body. Thank you. Tony. I'll choose the latter part of my public service state commission because one minute I couldn't ask for twenty-two years of the state senate. <laughs> there was a lot of noise, um, somewhat rhetoric around the special assessments when I was first elected to this city commission and came back to my point about solving problems, um, proposed a, a, a task force to sit down and spend time going through the particulars of um through meeting and the state extension code behind special assessments and the formulas of the process, city of Bartles actions, and frankly, um, some decisions were made, decisions were made in 2015 that were a little overreaching, putting too much burden on the commercial property, for example, in particular. So as a result of that whole 21 month process, if you will, uh, 34 recommendations that came from the task force, uh, well over 30, 32 of them were implemented and changes were made um, at the city of Bartle. And I know there's probably one individual still carries the banner of special assessment being a problem in town, but largely it really calmed the water, so to speak, of <coughs> citizens' concerns, uh, true concerns over um, the impact of special assessment. So I, I have to say that's probably one of my pride accomplishments. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the floor? Uh, okay, um, so another uh, item to consider is I'm sure you're kind of building into um, educating yourselves on what's been going on with the Capstone Commission. Um, is there an issue from that the county has been dealing with, say, for the last 10 years that's still ongoing and um, something that you'd like to see addressed or maybe how it might relate to the HBA and its members? Anything there that you see that you would like to address? And I think do we go back to Tony on the Sun products? Yeah, great question. You know, at a high level, um, you know, the effort and the crusade to move the diversion along um, with the county role um, is now we're building it and we're beyond, you know, the, the challenge of the upstream uh, protests. Um, state has taken over a large portion of the human service budget uh, for social services in Cass County. So some of the challenges the Cass County is now looking for, you know, it's obviously 911 dispatch center from an infrastructure standpoint and collaboration. Um, staffing, uh, appropriate staffing and, and wages for uh, personnel to make sure we're you know, moving the county services along uh, where it's needed. Um, but I've been out a lot of the small towns and um, talked to a lot of the local leaders and the rural communities and uh, it's all about roads. So that gets back to the budgeting and um, whether it's perhaps not being maintained or uh, asphalt 
Um, that seems to be the number one prevailing uh, topic in rural Cass County is roads. Uh, I completely agree with everything Tony said. I'll yes and and expand on one of them, which was keeping the county uh, workforce. The Cass County employs about 500 employees. Those include folks that serve the jail and uh, provide things like addiction treatment services and Cass Public, or Cass Public Health, rather. Uh, those are not easy jobs or high stress jobs, and they're not um, for the proper kind of work environment. They can easily be burnout jobs. As you can well imagine, and uh, COLA cost of living and uh, adjustment has been a can that's been kicked a little bit down the road, I think, by the county commission. I think it needs to be acted on. There was a study done on it last year, and the current increase of the jail workers is temporary. And we do know we have a lot of type administrators on the record saying that the employees are telling him that they are speaking with other private sector companies and jobs that can pay them more. And you have to think about not being penny wise with power force because if you have to retrain a new workforce, uh, that can cause a lot of dips in productivity as anybody in the private sector uh, knows. I'll add to for public gas, there's a little bit of a, has been a little bit of a HR snap, but I don't think it's been investigated far enough. That's in the part of the That's what I do. Okay, thank you. Any questions yet? Um, Rocky, do you want to just ask about the incentives and oh, how that work? Stop me again. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I asked this previously, but you know, the, the county commission gets a say in property tax incentives, and uh, I think that's a good thing uh, on some level, even though it's relatively new. It does open up the opportunity where there's now three sort of public debates over an incentive that gives maybe the naysayers of, of growth more opportunity to talk about their narrative while at the same time developers or applicants have to go through three different elected boards and try to please three different ones and that can be uh, complicated as well. So I, my question was what what do you think you could do to maybe streamline the process or work with the city so there's mm -hmm. more agreed upon terms ahead of time so that it's not three individual debates trying to happen instead of getting the front end. Or then uh, we'll obviously reach out and speak with the city and not just Fargo, but West Fargo uh, as well. Find out who and how, you know, why that structure was set up the way it was, if there's a reason behind it, because maybe it's cumbersome, but there was a reason, maybe it's never been thought of, and ask if it can be proposed. I'd like to know if the county commission has the authority to streamline that, because something I don't like, especially the local candidates, is when they promise something and they truly do not have a jurisdiction. So I think so. I need to know that first. And in general, as a philosophy with incentives, I think unfortunately I put this on a questionnaire that we kind of got had these absolutes where I mean just frankly, Tony Garrett kind of made a crusade of demonizing any and all incentive as a terrible giveaway that was, you know, whatever with the um taxpayer. And then the response seemed to be to be pro-incentive in most cases. And I do think the initial question is something to be built with something that would have been without an incentive, just, just through the private sector and the market itself is a good appropriate one to pass and will preserve the incentive process for where we need it because it will be then be viewed as more legitimate. And I think those things need to be revisited years down the road as well, from the county level and where we can interact with the city. Okay, thank you. Fine. And I believe that required additional review and, and support. Uh, I've long standing been a supporter of incentives. That's largely what I've done in my career is economic development for primary sector mm -hmm. for a targeted purpose. You know, Fargo, the city of Fargo has probably the best uh, policy on incentives in the state, quite frankly. And, you know, anyone's eligible to follow and use those incentives based on the intention that the Fargo, city of Fargo set up for a strategy. Uh, so it's it's prudent and it's proper as far as the, the opportunity for the developers to use that to their benefit, whether it's affordable housing or a traditional economic development project. Um, in my mind, you know, the where the personal opinion comes in on the metrics is um, 10 years is kind of a good frame of reference for um, the work of developers and within the policy. Anything above 10 years should be looked at the level of engagement, level of investment. Block nine, for example, $125 million project, it warrants maybe a different look because of the magnitude of the project. All right, thank you. Um, oh, so, yeah. so to that point, uh, taking a greenfield development versus a you know, downtown economic or something to do or a renaissance zone, what would uh, 
proposal for a uh, position be for county to somehow either defer taxes, specials, or anything else. Developer is faced with a huge risk to go in, so they can either put in a much smaller uh, phase and drive up the cost for a lot because you don't get the economies of scale, but yet take the risk to put in a larger development and get the benefits of scale for the end user. But yet we're taking a cornfield that was maybe $200 for a section of tax income to now put in all this, but yet there's really no, no, no bucket for that to fit into for any sort of other than um, deferring or uh, cost sharing or anything else. So what, what would be a creative solution for that to try to help uh, stimulate some of that stuff and uh, share some of the, I wouldn't say share some of the risk, but really just to kind of offset some of those upfront costs. Tommy, from, uh, from a project that's county oversight, the county commission directing the agent. Just all of it, because obviously, you know, the county still is, is has their portion of, of the sugar tax as well as uh, all of us along with it. What comes to mind is the payment of the tax program that would, you know, through negotiated payment up front that would forego that you have an even payment over up to a 20 year period, depending on the size of the project, if one period that could be reviewed, I think. And whether it started at the city or it ended up at the county or originated the county that's where I think you are where I'm coming from I mean a uh, developer ends up paying a, now a new assessed value on an empty lot uh, that is largely still in the same cornfield it just doesn't have corn on it anymore but yet we put a sizable investment into it but yet the meter all, all of a sudden starts spinning really quickly uh, of interest in special and certainly uh, county and, and city taxes and public and school district all basically all the three entities that have been talked about. It might be a similar way to the example what happened the project in Castleton with that soybean crushing plant the county firm with the city of you know, Castle approved. That would seem to have a little controversial, but all the county is affirmed by a local government chose. Yeah. yeah. I would potentially be fine with a delay in the taxation per because it's occurring, but Hike incurs one of the uh, where it gets resolved, right? Platted. I platted. I you wouldn't entertain that, but again, it kind of goes back to what I said to Rocky earlier. I wonder how much jurisdiction the county truly has over that. Uh, and I think it would depend on if it's in city versus county land. And I think the state comes into play pretty quickly there, although it is property tax, so I'd love it at the county level. So I'd entertain that, but I would want to make sure that the application was extremely fair, aka anyone and everyone could apply for that in the same year when you apply. And because I mean you have you all seen it, you've seen the bad impression that it, that some incentivizations get now that it's a uh, hated place to be nasty, but it, it, you know the bigger projects are getting raised this more to seem like uh, a startup developer could come into the market. I'm a startup developers. No, I understand that's a huge capital cost of that, but when it comes to any kind of public incentive, it needs to be fair cost of work in my view. Okay, thank you. Um, one question I wanted to raise was um, years ago, the uh, relationships with the, the county and the municipalities wasn't always as strong as it could be. Not present, including present company excluded um, since Commissioner Breiling had Join the commission, I there things we've made headway in different areas. And so previously we had um, when different industries and, and the business community was um, really supporting the diversion um, efforts for permanent flood protection and things like that. And we were walking the halls of, of the legislature, the Capitol, um, working with the Fargo City Commission, the different jurisdictions and so on, and going to the County Commission for support of the projects and the protection. Um, another example would be the Career Academy, the Career, um, the Center for, uh, the Career Innovation Center, um, which Commissioner Brighton brought up the funding support for that earlier today. Um, how do you see yourself working with municipality <laughs> And being on the Cass County Commission, and do you see any gaps there with working with the, the municipalities in those jurisdictions, or improvements, or what? You know, what do you see that look like for the future? So Ben, I think we need to start with you, right? Yeah, I 
So, um, so I am in that consultant which is fairly important because it's the county where the cities and the county where we're seeing, and we have to make sure and include Castleton, Harwood, Horace, Mapleton, uh, all the surrounding areas when we're doing that too. I think it starts with what you're saying, the basic communication sitting down. I have already sat down with a good portion of the Fargo City Commission and I'm working my way through the West Fargo one. I won't tell you my hero for that right now, but uh, being in touch with them, paying attention to their meetings and asking them what they need on a county level, making sure if there are questions that those are getting answered and having context placed behind them because things can slip through the cracks or appear different on paper than they were discussed at the meeting because not everybody can make every meeting. And being, again, that proactive elected official that's going out there, letting folks know and showing up to a commission meeting and taking part in the public comment section and saying, hey, just so you know, this is what we're looking at, how we want to make sure you know you guys were, you know, okay with this. I think what, what you were thinking about taking that back as part of our meeting. That's incredibly important. I, I probably would have more time like that. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, piggybacking with Ben said, I think a lot of it falls down to communication and building relationships. Um, and I had a conversation on that graph with a farmer and um, he was pontificating over the county uh, paving the road out by Horace when it should be the city of Fargo taking care of that. And when is the dollars for that road could have gone somewhere else? But you know, whether it's you know an individual landowner, uh, farmer, or city uh, city leaders, you know, it's about relationships and having trust built with one another. It's you know, half of some of the times you know, in the world, the city of Fargo, for example, the big city and the small city, um, you know, you probably get a set of experiences that are different in a city of size of Fargo versus um, air in our or and so I think it's incumbent on you know the leaders of the county in particular to um, kind of be the bridge for that to bring people together and, and solve common problems. <coughs> solve common problems that at the end of the day is somewhat is tied to common problems, whether you're a city of 100 people or a city of 100,000 people. Thank you. Um, I uh, one other question, and then we'll probably go into summaries. Um, can you both give us uh, an idea of where you worked with the HB in the past, or you've had an issue as a political elected leader um, that you saw that it would work well to bring the HBA into it to help solve that problem? And give us an example. I mean, you're probably going to have to dig deep. So, so the case case case. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we we kept, we'll allow two minutes for this one. Okay. Um, so, but anyway, and I think do we go to Tony on this one first. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think the question I, I have to refer back to, um, you know, special assessments committee, for example, um, um, the impact that had long term changes in this. Um, HBA was front and center on that discussion. Um, Grace and I had early on discussions about planning how that would be set up and who should be on the committee. And you know, as a, as a side note, wrapped around that, it, it, in the last four or five years, two different conversations with Governor Burgum on sprawl, Greenfield versus everybody living in dense area. And, you know, I said one of those conversations is, um, you know, it's very important that we understand the effect the Home Builders Association of Eternal Moorhead has on this economy. You look at the membership and the vitality of what they bring to the community for housing. And um, and so we can't displace one industry for another. I mean, that's you know, didn't tell him he wanted to be Russia, but he was close to see that from a standpoint of free market. And and so from a standpoint of you know the role that HBA has, um, you know, maybe a lot of folks don't realize the the impact and the and the economic consequences of not having a, a well-run association in this region. It's um, I think it's second to none. So uh, those are things that are on my mind as I've been in the local world. If you will, with the okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, as far as interactions with the HBA, I was uh, I had the privilege of being on the public issues committee for uh, almost four years. And I really enjoyed the heck out of it during the candidate form, seeing everybody learning the issues that are impacting are still impacting uh, all the construction business, residential construction businesses here and their commercial counterparts of that association as well. As far as interactions with uh, public issues, uh, that's why I guess the first bad time we got the diversion impacting uh, uh, it's uh, flood impacts onto uh, uh, public and private property and then hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billion dollars in land and land value we can lose if a um, flooding event or you know basically two more feet 
but in 2009 would occur here if we don't have permanent diversion. Uh, individual issues like uh, we hear is like right, Mr. Bissonnet, which would be like sprinkler requirements like Minnesota overreached and did back in, I want to say 2012, where they were requiring sprinklers to be installed in any building over 4,000 4, square feet, which of course really hampered people making luxury large homes who wanted to express in North Dakota we were having multi family put up without uh, tested sprinklers being put into, say, hallways that were. Absolutely dangerous for the fast amount of construction we're putting up there. We got that HPA here involved because we have the two states. And the unique situation of having Fargo and Moria here, where we could bring the perspectives and hopefully bring both sides together and find the middle ground that would make common sense and make, ensure both safety and economic growth on both for both residents, co builders, and builders themselves. Um, but you know, talking about you know, special assessments with the city and going out. And, Lobbying at the Capitol with the Home Code Association after my time on, I think it was 2017, uh, with the association and support, uh, I, you know, be very supportive of the dollars that HPA and others have uh, been looking at and supporting the trade school initiative because we all know we have major, major workforce issues here. And we also have a very large population when we train people, right? We have the best workers, when we have the best workers, we'll have the best product. And I think the county can play a role with that. And I was very supportive of that during my time with the legislature as well. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other mm -hmm. questions? All right. Well, we will go ahead and do a wrap up then. And so then I think we close with you. No more. We do. It, it, it's getting hard to keep track. Yeah. <laughs> and you have two minutes. All right. Okay. Um, thank you again for uh, the time you gave to both of us. And again, for being involved here. Uh, I, uh, when I saw the county commission seat opening up, I um, didn't know. I figured there'd be somebody lined up, um, someone who's a big name, may have been in office before. I don't know. <laughs> 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 And I didn't see anybody happening. I did also have people reach out to me, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, I think I can really contribute to that in a way that I think would be that positive for the county because I think I can bring the perspective of someone who's been involved in the state legislature, been in private business here in town, been a lifelong resident, and I do does care. But I also bring that, uh, you know, a detail-oriented approach, an aggressive amount of communication externally from the typical avenues of what uh, someone who would be serving on a county commission would see. There's nothing wrong with any of those things, but those county commission meetings are for the county commission meetings. There's a lot of members of the public that don't interact with the county commission and making those issues front and center and educating the public on things that might be considered boring or maybe a, a media person would say wouldn't get to clicks on social media, so to speak, because I think what their elected official does, and I think I would bring that um, to the table here. So appreciate your consideration. I hope I can earn your vote. Your time again. Thanks. Thank you. Well, again, I appreciate the opportunity to come to court and share a little more. Um, my father was a 39 year employee uh, with Cass County Road Department, and um, he's not been with us now for 10 years. But uh, I think he would have a smile on my, his face looking down that his son got involved in county government because that's where he lived, the town that his bread and butter came from, and the county services. I, I'm running on some pillars, obviously, that are, I think are important to county government, which is economic development. Um, I had a lot of experience in the workforce development uh, role in the career academy, which is more work yet to do on that front. Uh, public safety is first and foremost on everyone's minds. Continuing the support and leadership we need in the county to protect our communities, as well as infrastructure. Uh, I believe my tenure and connection to the legislative halls, um, with whether it's state funding, I'm going to lobby on behalf of Cass County and our communities um, that be a big benefit with my role. In Relationship, even though there's a lot of change, uh, still know a number of folks out in the halls of legislature and seem to be an advocate and, and step up and solve problems when they emerge. I mean, I think that's coming on a elected leader, whether it's city or county or state, because they will solve problems. Um, and there's a particular role for the county, just like there is with the city and the legislature. And much like the city and the county, we need to form of the legislature and we can balance the budget and provide appropriate safety measures. And ordinances were appropriate. So, you know, my background is well suited for that. I'm excited to see what the voters say. Thank you, Tony. And thank you to both of you. Um, I'm looking forward to just having more conversations with county commissioners, and and um, it's just an area that we haven't been involved with over probably this last 
12 months. Um, it, it's it's been such a different time for us as an organization and for our members. And so I'm looking forward to building, rebuilding those bridges again. We've, we've always had good relationships with the, the different county commissioners, but um, as we were telling Commissioner Brightland this morning that um, we've, uh, we just haven't had those meetings like we used to have, and we need to do that more, do a better job of that. So I really appreciate the two of you giving us your time today. Um, I wanted to reiterate too, I didn't talk about it at the beginning, but again, and I think you both know full well through your history with us that the Home Builders Association is a resource for our political leaders and our elected officials and um, to feel free to use us as a resource anytime for questions, statistics, um, but we look forward to that open lane of communication um, that we've enjoyed for so many years with the County Commission. Um, in the way we can call and visit about things. Um, the other thing I wanted to just commend both of you for running in this time where there's uncertainty and it's hard to find individuals who will run. Um, the county commission meetings are not like the city commission meetings. I mean, they 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 are challenged with issues, but um, there's a error at the county level that is maintained with respect, and it's nice to see that versus what happens at some of the city commissions. So, um, and I think that our county in our region is going to be winning with whichever one of you is successful at um, the election day. So um, it's really comforting to know that there's two wonderful candidates that are running for the position. So thank you for being here. We wish you the best, both of you. And um, let's give them a round of applause. for them.